so we're just going to uh, do a short video on how to change the BIOS uh, battery in an E-Series controller. So this is a, a, an E-Series controller, so the first thing I want to do is make sure I'm ESD grounded out. So I'll use an ESD strap and make sure I've grounded out. And then I'm going to uh, remove the controller by the four uh, set screws that are in here. So I just need a, a, an M10 uh, socket. I'm just going to loosen those off so we can gain access to the back of the controller. So now I've removed the four bolts, what I can do is just uh, remove the safety controller, flip it over so I can gain access to the battery. So that's where the battery is. So I'm just gonna So now we've got the replacement battery, we can then put it into the safety control board. Like that. And then basically now we're just going to do the reverse of what we did before, which we're going to put actually put the safety control board back into the controller. But we just need to make sure that when we put it back in, we take good care that we don't actually hit that transistor there. So once the, uh, the cables are reattached, now we can put it back into the controller. Like I say, we just need to make sure that we are careful around the back of that transistor. Okay, now the uh, safety controller is back in place, we just need to plug in the teach pendant and then use uh, two cable ties for the strain relief so it doesn't uh, pull and strain the cable. Okay, thanks for watching, we'll have another video shortly.
here again for Cobalt Weekly. This week my guest is James Dowthwaite from the University of Sheffield. Hi James. Hi Mark. Um, James, can you tell us a little bit about your role uh, and what your organisation does? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name's uh, Dr James Dowthwaite. I'm a researcher from the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm personally involved in projects across the AMRC, uh, the Nuclear AMRC, uh, AMRC Kaimaru, uh, on topics of digital twinning, collaborative robotics and industrial safety. Excellent, excellent. Um, how can like research hubs like the AMRC and the universities um, help companies with the adoption of collaborative robots into their factories? Oh, it's, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, yeah, so as part of what I've been doing more recently is uh, trying to get exactly that question. Is, uh, is trying to appreciate and understand the distance between a lot of the challenges that we're facing in the industry from the academic perspective. Uh, but also better frame research to help us attack those problems in a meaningful way. Um, and how can we help? How can we help? Um, well, what we're helping do at the moment is creating awareness, education on many of the different subjects that, we're, that are involved in our industry, uh, but also encourage funding into the sector. Uh, and also well, create more excitement about various topics between the different elements that we're looking at. And it's, um, it's an exciting time to be involved in robotics from all sides, right, I see. I think it's two important things, isn't it, to uh, encourage enlightenment about that, so that the funding is put into that sector, and also mm -hmm. increasing the skills, because as robotics grows, we need more and more people to be able to program robots and actually install robots, so that's an important oh. part of that. Oh, precisely, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's, there's a skill set of this, absolutely, as well. The university is obviously primarily an educational institution, and um, research being so closely related to education, we're able to you know reflect themes from research directly into education. Uh, generate excitement as people move through the education pathway and start considering careers in, in industry and academia all within the world of the robotics. Excellent, excellent. And what sort of uh, tasks are being automated sort of quicker than others? Do you, are there particular areas that you're seeing this being adopted sooner rather than later to maybe fill skills gaps or? Ooh, yeah. Well, I think it depends greatly on the area that we're looking at because I think there's, from a, from a high level view, the world of robotics can be broken down to many different areas and some are more amenable to the robotics industry uh, and some uh, have many years um, away from being directly applied. So um, again what I'm personally involved with is, is trying to find those that are potentially low-hanging fruit yeah. and shortening the distance um, uh, by identifying and even quantifying the pathways that those, those programs can take but also help students come along that journey and prepare for a, a career in industry uh, but also bring new skills to the table as well. And that's the key, isn't it? Those pathways, once you can identify those, we can guide people down those pathways to make it easier to implement the robots into their manufacturing sectors, if you like. Yeah, I think it's something that's not really uh, given, uh, well, I say, it's given a lot of attention, but it's not necessarily framed in the way that it sh I feel like it should be. Yeah. Uh, and I get this from a lot of feedback from different projects that we're involved with, but also mainly from people in the industry um, who feel that things should have been slightly differently. Um, but that, when I, what, I, what I mean by that is that emphasis can be can often move on to things that aren't directly applicable to industry right now, but industry of tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and helping understanding the value right now is something that's you know very important. And um, what, we, what we're trying to do right now is basically move, yeah, change oh. the agenda really to to make it move forward at a much quicker pace, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bring those values to the front of the queue. Yeah. So that we can frame the research and the educational pathways that you know that come from that research and, and celebrate that research um, uh, in a way that industry industry can see as amenable to themselves and their products. Exactly, because they're, they're, you're going to help them avoid the pitfalls of long development times because you'll have already done a lot of that research and be able to present that to people. So to, to sort of help them boost their their or shorten their installation time so that they can actually see the benefits quicker, I guess. That's the, that's the main question, yeah. if you like. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point to raise. It's like, it's coming to the, straight to answer the original question, um, is that a lot of the themes of research are looking at that, that deployment time, looking at the system as a whole, uh, and understanding the challenges, not just with respect to productivity, with effectiveness, but also with respect to the overall capability and the flexibility of that system but also understanding about how we can use things like new technologies from the world of in, um, IoT, from digital twins, um, and more collaborative technologies, like universal robotics technologies, uh, to create an environment that moves away from the traditional industrial platforms locked away behind um, uh, closed doors uh, into what we call the factory of the future, um, which is more 
versatile uh, and more attractive to upcoming generations of students. Oh, excellent. excellent. And one of the things that we asked, we get asked about about smaller manufacturing companies are particularly prone to sort of labour shortages and staff retention. And mm -hmm. it, it's one of the things that how collaborative robots can be used to sort of help fill that gap. Are you seeing that in your research with you know talking to companies as well? Yeah, it's it's an. In, I've been asking myself this question as well recently because I think the role collaborative robotics play in this is is is, uh, is, is seen differently from research and from uh, from. Um, industry as far as I can see it. But quantifying how is, 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 is a little bit challenging because um, I see it from, 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 a, uh, from a small company point of view. It represents an easier on-ramp, an easier um, tap to, well, to the robotics industry, um, but also a way to approach and trial robotics without investing in the large scale equipments. Yes. Um, because obviously that represents a huge, a potentially huge upfront cost. Uh, to invest in a large, a large amount well, of cost and time, I guess, as well. Oh well, yeah. yeah, and expertise, and yes. stuff like that too, and uh, training requirements, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole party. Um, but from the academic side, it gives us a, an in, a way to interface with, with, with industrial problems from a from an approach where we can, you know, we can expose students to this and and generate impactful research studies that are actually testable and safe to interact with. Yeah, yeah. and one of the things you touched on earlier was quite interesting. Was, um, how can digital twins help companies of all sizes really mm -hmm. sort of evaluate whether collaborative robots is for them? Ah, so this is you now I'm talking because uh, digital twins is my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we they represent the next level as far as I'm concerned uh, with, when it comes to creating uh, contextually aware collaborative robotics applications. Yeah. So what this allows us to do is to move beyond traditional robot's job to robot finds job. Robot is aware of the process that, as a whole and therefore appreciates its position in the context of that application. And what this means is we can look at things like safety beyond the context of the individual robot. Uh, and what this means is we can start looking at things productivity wise beyond the individual system and help, and well, I should say, that creates a lovely interface for companies to also approach the collaborative robotic process and understand things like productivity, or understand things like what it means to have humans and robots in the same process, uh, but also look at things like cycle time um, for the individual robot and for the process as a whole as well. It's interesting because uh, uh, you can't improve on anything until you actually measured it, and a lot of people haven't actually mapped out their process. Yeah, <laughs> well, this is exactly something I've seen going around and speaking to companies across the UK is that like understanding that initial reference line, like how productive I'm being right now, um, is is is, is already a challenge. Mm. Uh, especially when quantifying return on investment, uh, when looking at how, should I invest in this and what kind of productivity gains like uh, will, will I see? And from the people I spoke to, people have seen a huge shift from when they actually take the plunge, but it's perfectly reasonable to say that there's a lot of risk up front. It's, it represents a big investment. So um, some of the people I spoke to have ranged in from 500% to 20%, depending on the application that they're looking at um, in a single task. And it's, it's there's an exciting real opportunity there. Um, I think it's a, it's, it is a real opportunity for people to to trial something out and de-risk it before actually making that first step and implementing it into their factory, isn't it? And I think that's what's exciting ah, for people okay. having that kind of interface where you can you can trial a, a digital twin of a process mm. without actually getting a, a robot on your factory floor and, and starting to take apart your machine and so on. Okay. It's, it's kind of it, I think that's quite attractive to people, isn't it, for the future? Is that mm. Could we drop in CAD models of what we've got here and look at cycle times and you could tell us how much that's going to improve, then that's a bit further in pushing us down the, the road to make the decision, yes, this is for us and this is how quicker we could get it implemented. So it's, it's a quite interesting concept, I think. Yeah, I think one thing to that is that you like to break it down into, there's difference, when you're dealing with digital twins in the robotics space, there's, there's pre-installation value and there's also post-installation value, but there's also, um, there's also end of life value. Um, with robotics so, and you know, introducing the technology to, to the marketplace is that the, the, the pre-installation value and the, and the installation value have to be super clear to make that risk worth accepting. Um, and what we're looking to do is, is how, do we do that? how do we sell that, yeah. that, 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 that mountain? Um, but digital twins uh, represent an opportunity to make that super, super clear mm -hmm. um, to help us show the risks up front, try things out, as you said, um, 
simulate and get sample results before that is commissioned. Yes. Um, but also in the quantify things that might be a little more nebulous, like um, safety concerns, yeah. um, uh, projected costs, projected valuations, uh, and even risks themselves. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was going to ask about, you know, with your interactions with companies that you've, you've currently had, um, is there particular areas that you've, that you've seen, that you mentioned skills deficits, where there are areas where robots can help fill those skills gaps. Mm. One of the sort of anecdotal things that we've been asked about is like um, welders, you know, there, there is a, a shortage of welders in the UK, but mm. is there any other areas that you've been seeing in research where robots can help fill that skills gap? Oh, I think yeah. There's a, there's there's the, the the dark, the dank, and the dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the tagline, isn't it? I think. Mm -hmm. um, they yes, repetitive tasks. Yep. Um, um, the, the the come up in, in every aspect of manufacturing. Okay. Well, a lot of things. Uh, things like grinding. Yeah. Uh, things like welding. Things like um, uh, cutting and manipulation. Uh, obviously, these are these are traditionally tasks that have been done by people, um, but they're not particularly uh, in, like a, necessarily a job that people would want to take on long term, uh, and there's because there are risks that, attached to those jobs as well. Aren't they? they might be yeah, really yeah. noisy or vibrations and so on. So yeah, there's been studies that show like a prolonged exposure to vibrating tools that causes nerve damage, mm -hmm. um, and it's also you know it's it's also a necessary and valuable task that's often mission critical. So it has to exist, mm -hmm. and that's where robots can they can they can take that away. It was one of the things that we, we get asked about quite a lot, and it's actually a, a byproduct of putting robots in there, is that you're actually increasing staff welfare mm -hmm. because you're not exposing them to do those kind of tasks that are horrible or tedious that nobody wants to do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, the big sort of negative connotations about robots taking jobs is we always say robots take tasks and take the horrible tasks away from operators. And your staff welfare and retaining those people is the most important thing, I think, that's that companies need to consider because retaining staff is a big problem, as we you know, as we've discussed. Yeah, it's. I mean, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, it's um it's it allows you to redistribute your your skills in a place where they're they're, they're, they're needed. Yes. Yeah, because that that task uh, is is essentially holding a company back in some respect. Yeah. Um, and then, and you there are skills and precious resources that that, that, that person represents that you know, the company cannot lose. And yeah. So you better put them in a place where they're more appreciated. <laughs> yes, and they're going to stay. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. Exactly. One of the things that one of the trends that we're seeing is um, a combination of uh, like a six-axis robot arm on the back of an AGV, and that might be a tending a process like a laboratory process or whatever. Mm. Um, do you see this expanding as a trend for the future? Oh, um, yeah, I think so. There's there's a couple of barriers though. Yeah, and I think this is the there is. And the main one being safety, yeah. I think, is the one that keeps this a repeated theme both on the academic side and on the industrial side. Is that is understanding, well, I should one step back, um, is that <laughs> when you're talking about mobile processes, there is the, there's, a, there's a prerequisite for a, a greater understanding of the, of the environment that yeah. the robots are operating in, uh, and understanding of the variability and of the human role. Um, a lot of the work that I do focuses on the human robot interaction element of this. And yeah. Uh, but for the purposes of assessing risk, um, when you have a six robot arm, access robot arm, you can, you know, stay safe by stepping away. Yes. <laughs> but um, mobile, mobile robots, uh, you, you need to make sure you know where they, where they are and what the procedures are for. Handling, yes. Handling a dynamic environment. Yeah. But yeah, mobility is a huge, huge selling point for robotics, uh, and as we're seeing this all over the industry, as far as I, from my experience. Um, as things move away from a traditional industrial static manufacturing line, just in a fixed position, yes. Yeah, yeah. With, with the barriers that is robotic, we are not. Yeah. Um, for safety reasons, obviously. Uh, to one that is shared. Yeah. Which is exciting because it gives us, first of all, on the academic side, much more interesting case studies. Yeah. But an industry uh, productivity that you that we've not seen before. It kind of opens up task groups that we would never have considered, like taking kits of parts to production lines and so on, which is. Which is something that's not a real value add task, is it? You know, it's, a lot of people are just involved in taking things from stores to production lines and back again, and, and that's perfect sort of application for a, a you know a robot and a, a guided vehicle to go and pick those and bring them to where humans are using their skill to assemble something. So. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there's there's lots of technology that's coming down the pipes from academia and from industry as well that are helping these technologies get into the spaces where they're needed. Yeah. Um, because it's quite easy to identify a task such as 
driving or welding as a repetitive but necessary task. But it's difficult to identify tasks such as logistics. You yes. All you're doing is moving a, a potentially a heavy weight or sharp component from A to B. Yes. Very amenable to robotics. Yes. And um, again, uh, automation can be useful. One question that I was going to ask you about. How do you think the development of end of arm tooling is going to help with the adoption rates of, of robots generally in the UK? Because we, we talk about the robot just being a platform basically, you're moving something between two places and that might be a rotating tool or a gripper or something like that. But it, it strikes me that that's the next big thing that's going to open up robotics is having much uh, smarter tooling to be able to pick and place and and react to the environment that's in. And you touched on it a little bit earlier yes, about, yeah. you know, uh, having robots that kind of understand the environment that they're in. But, mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that would, that would have a big effect on how usable robots are in industry? Oh, certainly. I mean, as we move towards this sort of more hybrid, more shared space, as we talked about, um, there, there is a necessity there to ensure that when they do interact, that you're not going to, you know, reducing the risk there as well. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, we obviously picking things up requires handing, you know, putting them down and then eventually exchanging them with people. Um, for that, we need grippers and effectors that will, you know, support that kind of level of interaction. Yes. But we're not compromising on effectiveness. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd also raise the standardisation. Like uh, that's one of the elements that I think is uh, is well something that you, you, you guys here at Universal have done exceptionally well. It's helped us bring a more regulated and more understandable ecosystem we like the UR plus scheme that we have yeah yeah, yeah exactly and it's and it helps us uh, in research and in academia basically assail new tasks and work out whether or not the effector is whether the robot and the effector is right for the task at hand yes yeah it's it's an interesting element but there's a couple of there's a couple of elements to play that play in this scenario yeah there's yeah. some considerations that we need to take into into account with, with before developing end effectors that that might be you know, revolutionary, the safety obviously is a big aspect of that, of course. Yeah. And how are cobots are being used at, at the University for Research? I mean, they're, they're being used in lots of different departments, but mm -hmm. um, we, we see them used in academia in, in different uh, organisations in the UK. I'm, I'm interested in the sort of things that, and why you would use the <laughs> UR robots as well. I mean, are they particularly easier to, to, to uh, program and live with, or mm -hmm. are they more sort of like open source than other robots? So it's a, it's a great question to ask because um, one thing, well, the main reason I guess is because uh, of how open uh, you are is to the, to the, to the academic community. Like, uh, it's one thing that makes approaching education programs and, uh, and research tasks particularly easy because mm -hmm. we, the integration step is formidable with most systems. Um, but when I say when designing a new case study, um, we have to build time planning. We have to understand the, the technical requirements up front, uh, and the way we do that is we look at the industry, we look at the what's available in the industry, and we look at not with respect just with respect to hardware, but also with respect to the software that comes through, which is a critical element. Yeah, and um, with a lot for a lot of large companies, that software support and the openness is not necessarily upfront, and transparency is is key. I believe personally that transparency is key for adoption in general, especially in academia. So it kind of makes it easy to live with, I guess, to have that openness in the software. I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I think needs to continue to be developed and echoed by many robotics companies. Um, yeah. One thing I was going to ask you about, um, do you think there needs to be a change in, we talked before about pathways for education to train people to get into robotics. Mm. Um, whether it's like an apprenticeship in robotics, similar to it, like an engineer or a, an electrician, do you think that would be a, a good idea for the economy to, to sort of set up these kind of um, roles, if you like, to, to be trained for? Because generally, robotics programmers have come to a kind of university course. Do you think there's something, uh, an opportunity to run parallel to that? For the, Maybe well, a more practical course, perhaps. I mean, I, I, I think so. So uh, on our side, it's a question of funding and ownership, like uh, who's doing it and and, uh, what, and what it yields to the university's portfolio. Yeah. Um, but these, the skill set and the direction the UK's manufacturing sector is going screams that this has to be at the forefront. Um, because robotics will soon be a skill set that, that many people in the sector should have and, will, and companies will be looking for because, as we know, the manufacturing, the manufacturing sector is becoming slowly more automated. I mean, we're lagging behind G7, so as we've talked about in the past, yes. 
Um, but we hope to catch up and become competitive on a global scale again. It's the way the industry has to go. I think there's only one way to do that, isn't it? Be innovative, and we've we've always yeah. done that in the UK. We've we sort of grasped innovation, and I think yeah, we're good at it. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. the opportunity okay. is, is great for us to to make that leap. I think in the next sort of five to ten years. I think. Mm. And one last thing I was going to ask you is, are there any developments that you're working on that you think would be important for people to consider um, in, in sort of robotics generally at the moment with regards to your research? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, yes, so I'm involved in multiple projects across the university uh, and the different capital centres we work with. Um, as I mentioned previously, we do a lot of work with digital twins. Um, but specifically orientated towards the bar the gap between academia and industry. Yeah. And what I'm trying to basically do is help academ academia and industry communicate transparency, as I mentioned before, being key. Um, and we're doing this by uh, engaging different capital centres as a way of test driving new pipelines and uh, whilst you know, engaging in industry uh, to help us understand what the true pathways are. To narrow, to narrow down what, what is the value and how do we get that value up front uh, and bring that to a point where it can be appreciated in industry and used to ultimately get more grant funding yeah. to do exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the research projects themselves, um, I'm currently involved in this is called the Twinality Project. Uh, and what this is, is a collaborative robotics uh, platform um, that enables safety to be deployed on an application level. Uh, and we think this is really interesting. And um, we're using this to basically take collaborative robots uh, and apply a level of safety that extends this in a way that companies can basically you know, do this offline yes. or online uh, and understand the risks up front and help them quantify it with things like return on investment but also understand the training requirements and needs uh, and put them in contact with the, with the people who know the best. And that'll accelerate adoption presumably, that's the, the whole aim of this. I guess. Oh absolutely, I mean, it's something you and I obviously yeah. share as a, as, a, as a value uh, up front is this if you, from my perspective, you know, to increase this and in, to increase this adoption, is that it's transparency from end to end. Yes. But that, but it's obviously a very serious and uh, a very serious industry. There are lots of technical requirements, but also human requirements too. And um, yeah, we need to make sure that everything is considered and no compromises are made along the way. <laughs> Well, thank you, James. Uh, that's all for this episode. Uh, join us next time. We'll have another guest and we'll talk about the world of robotics. Bye.